Welcome to the Mam Journals. I'm here at the NEC. Some of you remember where I was here a short while ago and I was actually doing covering of a classic auction. Now I love the old bikes and it's a great trip down memory lane. But the reality is the bikes available today are probably the best that's ever been available. Power, technology, brakes, handling. It's a great opportunity here at the Motorcycle Live Show to see the latest offerings in the market. Now clearly I can't cover all of them. So what I have decided to do is go around and have a look at a few that have caught my eye and a few of the new models that have been released for 2024. And now I've chosen the ones I like. I suspect a number of you would have chosen other ones but that's okay, we're all different and the variety of bikes out there in the marketplace really reflects how diverse motorcycling is in the modern world. I hope that you enjoy this video. I'm always struck by these Honda sports bikes and, and this one in particular is very special. They're, they're sort of petite but enormously powerful, 214 PS. So. Um, Clearly, they've got a great deal of intent with this. Most of my performance bikes are now more upright, but it doesn't stop me thinking these are things of beauty. This is a, a return to the, well, famous Honda 600. I think the last time they did one of these was 2017, but oh, that's from memory, so it, it may be wrong, but it's great to see them back. And as I've just said, really, I, I really enjoy the sporting look of these. They look fantastic and I think they're going to be a lot of fun, they'll handle well. Let me go through the specs with you. The bike produces 119 horsepower at 14 250, so like its predecessors, it's a screamer. Um, it does 46 and a half um, pound foot at 11 and a half thousand revs. Quite a light bike, 193 kilograms and that's got a six axis IMU, which of course the SP, the one we just looked at, has as well, but it's nice to see it on the 600 as well. Quite intent on purpose, I always like to look at the geometry on a bike and find out what the rake is, and down here, the rake obviously being the angle from there to the forks, measuring the angle between there, and that's a nice sharp 24.06, so that'll turn quickly. They do do this one in um, the darker colours as well. I, I'll be surprised if the red, which is a traditional Honda colour, didn't prove to be the best seller. For this year, they've Honda have introduced a larger capacity Hornet. We obviously had the 750, which they launched last year, and. Um, this is the thousand. It's got an old fire blade engine in it, and by using the word old, I'm not being derogatory. Um, but it's it's clearly not up to the full tune. They say this is going to produce slightly more than 147 brake horsepower, so it's not at the upper end of of what bikes like this produce. And it's to me, it's quite a conservative sort of approach on it. It has got a six-axis IMU. Um, which again I, I like to see on bikes if you've got this sort of power why not have the added, added technology and it was something that some of you might remember I, I actually did the Neo the CB1000R I tested that earlier this year and I enjoyed it which I described it at the time as being an engine and some other stuff and in a way they've sort of kept that going to me this is a little bit a little bit bland if I'm honest to my eye um, but it's a bit of a, a UJM for, 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 of a certain generation, you'll know what that means. Uh, universal Japanese machines, and some people, when they describe bikes like that, they mean it as a criticism. I don't. Um, what it was, in the day, was it was a four-cylinder bike in a cradle frame that was very competent and did the job. And I suspect this is going to do that. And it may not be gathering crowds at your local cafe, but when you get out, it's got a good level of technology, it will ride really well, and it will probably go forever. So, nice to see it out, reasonably priced within the market space, and Honda make about 19 million bikes a year. They can't all be masterpieces that collectors are queuing up to buy. Some of them have to be bikes which people buy, use, and then sell. This, I suspect, is gonna be one of those. This is fitted with identical suspension and brakes to the CB1000R. 
that was an arm which I, which I tried. I found the brakes very competent. Uh, suspension didn't, I was, couldn't really do a fair test of it because the bike I tested had been modified and lowered. So, but I, I wasn't overwhelmed by the general feel of the suspension. Competent rather than brilliant would be my description. And I know that a few people who bought the the C the CB 1000R have taken the opportunity to upgrade the suspension if they were feeling like going track daying or pushing the bike a little harder than, than than you may do on the road. It's got plenty of torque and power though. Good fun to ride. One of the bikes that I wanted to see here on the Suzuki stand was this new R version of the popular and successful 8S. Obviously with the R they now put fair, fairings on it. I actually thought fairings were coming because if you look at the S you can see mounting points for it. So to me that was an indicator it's on its way. I think they've done it really nicely. You've got upgraded forks on this as well which is nice to see and slightly different mirrors obviously with a different fairing. It's priced competitively in my view. Um, about 8.8 8 they've just announced it is. So I think this will sell well. It's powered by the same engine it, which is the 776cc parallel twin 270 degree crank and uh, two balancer shafts. I enjoyed riding it early, the 8S version earlier in the year. I thought very highly of it and I wasn't alone in that. Others have, have commented on what a capable bike it is. In a lot of the comparison tests it comes out very well either winning or drawing um, depending on which journalist has done the review at the time. I think they'll go well. Nice to see it. This is a new bike from Suzuki and I was particularly looking forward to seeing it because some of you may recall I've actually got the um, the GT1000 version and we've done a lot of miles and I really enjoyed it. We've been down to Portugal earlier in the year and I've personally have done a solo run up to Scotland and it performed perfectly. So I was really intrigued to see this new one come out. One of the things I was really pleased to see that this bike has been fitted with is the six axis IMU unit um, pitch rolling your uh, measurements which is an, an added safety feature. Now I've done 30,000 miles in the last two years and I've never really had to use um, lean sensitive ABS in anger but it is nice to know that you've got that particularly as with these sort of bikes I tend to, to carry two up so any extra safety is appreciated when the technology is there. In fairness they've had it on the Hayabusa for some time so great to see it put across. The, um, the other thing I really like about this this bike as opposed to my own GT is it's got semi-active suspension which is a, another step forward for Suzuki so you probably understand I'm quite excited about the opportunity to ride one of these and uh, get an opportunity to see how good it is if it's anything like as good as my GT it'll be a fantastic bike another bike that's comparatively new to the Suzuki range is this RE version of the um, the 800 or 776cc engine produces about 83, 84 brake horsepower depending on they do two slightly different tunes between the 8S and the 8R and the 800 RE and DE. This is the Road Explorer version. I did a review of, of one of these recently and it's actually it's, it will come out on the channel in, in probably a couple of weeks time and very competent capable bike and I was doing some mathematics at the time and I was quite amused to find that actually this bike costs a third of the average salary in the UK and back in the early 80s when I bought my first mid-sized bike which was a Kawasaki um, straight four 650 that cost about a third of, of the average salary at that time so we often think that bikes are much more expensive uh, than they used to be but the reality is whilst other things are a lot more expensive certainly food accommodation and taxes um, and in terms of machinery you can buy a really capable bike for about the same amount of money that you could many years ago in the good old days <laughs> Hayabusa of course has been out for a while a uh, very capable bike need to do more miles on mine effortless to ride and phenomenal in the rain. As we just
to discuss. I do, uh, I'm very fond of my GT and we've got on really well with it. I've done 7,000 miles on it now, which considering the, the number of bikes I ride, that's quite a high percentage of my annual mileage. So I'm obviously liking it. You can always tell which bikes you like because you ride them. Like the new red color. We're here on the Royal Enfield stand, which um, I think it's beyond the stage where people can think that Royal Enfield is a small brand. Last year they sold 834,000 bikes, so um, they're definitely um, gearing up for the future. Most of those bikes, of course, get sold in the home market for them, which is India, and uh, with a population of 1.4 billion, they've certainly got plenty to run at, but they do um, export a lot of bikes, over 100,000, and they are a very progressive company. This is their experiment or their, one of their sort of modeling bikes on the electric capacity Himalayan as we call it, although I think they call it something slightly different. And I think it really demonstrates how serious they are and what a serious player they are in the, in the motorcycle marketplace. They don't do very big bikes, um, but they seem to be doing quite nicely in the small to mid-size sector. I think the best way to understand how the range works is, is to think of it in terms of engines. Um, there's a number of 350s that um, they do. They do a Meteor, they do the Classic, they do the Hunter, which is this bike here, and they've also recently introduced the Bullet. I've tested all of them except the Bullet, and um, a nice little bike. They do, um, they're, a, they're a bike you wouldn't want to spend too much time on dual carriageways with, because although they will do 70 odd miles an hour, I think they're more comfortable at the 55 to 65 miles an hour, and that suits a certain part of the market demographic in terms of what people are looking for. The next engine size they do is the 411, um, which again, single cylinder bike, produces a bit more brake horsepower and slightly more capable at um, sort of dual carriageway speeds. Uh, fifth is a bit of an overdrive. The, the, the bike's rugged, they do two versions. They do the Scram and the, again, I'm gonna call it the Himalayan, but I'll come back to that in a minute. And um, has proved popular. I tested both of them, the Himalayan and the, and the Scram. They're nice, rugged, capable, solid, reliable bikes. Yeah, the third engine category is, of course, the 650 Twin, which comes in uh, a number of derivatives. You've got the, this one, which is the Continental. You've got the Interceptor, which some of you will recall that I've got, uh, and then put a big ball kit on. And they've also got the Super Meteor, which I tried earlier this year, and I actually really enjoyed it. It's quite a heavy bike, um, but it, it will cruise all day at 80 miles an hour, and has that sort of cruiser-style um, foot peg arrangement and riding position. I think this was, a, this to me is, is a good example of how they progress their bikes over time. You know, there's a, a better level of sophistication in terms of the suspension, the forks on it. And indeed, the, you know, the introduction of the cast alloys was nice to see as well, which they have now put on some of the other bikes as well. This, this unit isn't universally popular. Um, but for those that wanted to upgrade that, I don't think it's a lot of money to do it within the package. Competent, but not brilliant. The star of the uh, Royal Enfield stand is, of course, the new bike, the, as I call it, Himalayan, but they're calling the Himalayan. So maybe they know more than I do. I, I would hope so, <laughs> in terms of how it's actually pronounced. And what's in, this again really demonstrates the continued progress that Royal Enfield continues to make it as a brand. It's got upside down forks on it. It's got a liquid cooled 452 cc engine and producing 39.5 horsepower, let's call it 40. And it's got a new dash on it, which we'll, we'll try and get a photo for you in a, in a moment. And I'm looking forward to riding one of those. I think that'll be yet another step in the brand's progress. It's a great story. 
BMW has been enjoying success in the upper end of the specialist market for some years, record years, probably for the best part of a decade. And I, they did 200,000 bikes last year, which bearing in mind they don't sell any small ones, is quite remarkable in itself. And it's allowed them to develop bikes in, in different ways and in different areas. This bike is probably critical to the success of the overall brand. Now, the GS range, and the 1200, 1250, and now the new 1300, um, is really the heart of the BMW business and following. Some people uh, have um, immediately responded positively to the looks and the feel and the dimensions of the bike, others less so, but of course, the real proof will be in the riding. I'm looking forward to getting an opportunity to ride one of these new 1300s and uh, hopefully in the new year when I can have it for a few days. I, I can sort of borrow one for a few hours but I don't feel for a bike as important as this I should be jumping to conclusions on the basis of a two hour test ride. So I'll be looking forward to testing it properly. Um, some of you will know I had a 1200, I've got a 1250 and I'd like to think I'm pretty balanced about how I feel about it. A couple of things have been, gone, have been developed on this bike which I think sound, certainly on paper, to be steps in the right direction. Let me just quickly talk you through and show you some of the things which are now fitted to this slimmer, lighter, more streamlined bike. Okay, the, the, the bike is still, it's, a, it's still a boxer twin. It's significantly slimmer, it's air and water cools, it's got double overhead cams and the old one was 1254cc and this is actually 1300cc. It produces 143 brake horsepower and that's up from 134 on the previous bike. They've also increased the torque which I always thought was a great strength of the bike and the, the 1250 was um, produced 143 and this produces 149. It was never short of torque. It, you know, it's, it's one of those bikes, you don't worry about what gear in, you open the throttle and it pulls you through. Now, I'm really interested to see how they've done with the new gearbox. The, the old gearbox used to be at the back here and now they've gone underneath and I think it was probably if you were being objective and critical the gearbox was always one of the areas where you thought they had room for improvement so for me when I'm riding it that's what I'll be looking for to see if you've got more flexibility the, they had a, a quick shifter on on it although they don't call it they call it gear assist pro um, it's really I only find it helpful from sort of third onwards and it's not always easy to, to persuade it to come down. The bike is fitted with an improved suspension package, semi-active, but it's also you also get options. You can have a dynamic suspension, which gives you adjustment on the height. My 1250 is a low chassis bike, and apparently I won't need a low chassis bike. I can buy an application on on here or, a, or an option on here which will allow the seat height to reduce from its 850 to 820 automatically as you slow down so if that's the case and it works well then I think that'll be a, a very welcome addition again this is another one of those bikes when I'm hoping that I, uh, I for BMW who've got a lot of, who I have got a, long, a lot of time for as a brand I'm hoping that it's going to be a success and a significant improvement. On a personal basis, I'm sort of hoping I don't like it too much. I don't need any more bikes in the garage. Although I suspect if it rides half as well as it looks, I like the looks of the bike. I think it will um, it will go very well. Exciting new bike. This is a bike I particularly wanted to see at the show. It's the Yamaha XSR 900 GP, 12 and a half thousand pounds. And obviously it's done in these 
fabulous sort of retro Marlboro colours evoking memories of Agostini, Roberts, Lawson and Rainey during the 1990s when um, cigarette sponsorship was encouraged as opposed to verboten. Um, it's powered by the three-cylinder four-stroke, the, the 890cc. Again, it's 119 PS at 10,000 revs. It, interestingly enough, I've um, this year I've had a couple of opportunities to go with the Yamaha Experience and do some track days on it when I wobble very slowly around um, various circuits. And I've tried the R7 and indeed the R6, which I really enjoyed. And I contacted them earlier at, uh, a few weeks ago and, and said are they putting one of these on on the the fleet and fortunately they are so in May I shall be having a go around Donington on this or one very like this and I'm really looking forward to it we'll probably film a little episode on there where we talk about more details and specifications of the bike and try and get a GoPro fitted so you can see how not to ride round Donington but it will be a, a bit of fun and I'm sure I'll, I'll enjoy it something a bit different good to see Motorcycle News are doing the, green, the dream garage idea which of us hasn't done it money no object which 12 bikes would you have in your garage so we're going to have a look around here and see if we agree with their selection I doubt we will or I doubt I will um, but hopefully you'll enjoy it Honda Fireblade is obviously a classic in its time and one of the bikes that changed the motorcycling world when it came out. So a great deal of historical relevance. I always had hankerings after an urban tiger but never quite got round to it. Maybe one day. Please. GSX's of course, open the batting 84, 85 from memory um, with a 750 but of course they progressed over time and you ended up with uh, bigger, well more powerful bikes and they have definitely got a cult following. I think the GSX 750R is one of the best bikes ever made but what do I know? I suspect many of us would have a Ducati 916 based bike in their collection and that's a really nice one, obviously it's an SBS, so one of the specialised versions. I've got the 996R lurking somewhere in my garage, and um, they're great bikes to ride even today. Getting very collectible, um, Iconic Auctioneers had a sale recently, and a couple of them went for over £20,000. I wanted to talk about this bike, um, that's actually... The, the Interceptor Series 2, this is the last of them, 1970 bike, obviously American spec with the, uh, the high bars, sort of motocross sort of feel to it, but you can see it's got a couple of the sort of things that were on the last one, down here look, this is last model only, covers here, this is one of, an aftermarket sort of accessory, but they're like hen's teeth trying to find those, this is a really nicely sort of originalist bike with a spin fettled rather than modified in any way and it, it belongs to Steve Kane who's the PR manager for um, Europe Royal Enfield so nice to see that he's not only riding the new ones he likes the old ones too that was the inspiration for my um, big ball that I did in terms of a decluttered look you can see obviously I had no indicators in those days I did try mine without it, no indicators but um, the traffic today probably not a good idea I put some very small ones on uh, I'm not surprised to see a cattle in the collection this is actually Henry Coles and in his series he, he went through the rebuild it's a really nice job great great to see it here I don't think it would be in my collection as well but I do really like them and some of you may recall I've, I've just done a video on one uh, friend's bike which is absolutely immaculate as indeed is that and uh, it was great fun having that trip down memory lane this is a tweaked Hayabusa and I guess with the heritage of Hayabusa and, and its history over time it, it is a logical um, selection for the dream garage um, 
no idea what the power is on this one, but probably somewhere between really fast and terrifying. They're pretty brisk in standard form. Um, they, they've included this um, Arc Vector, obviously electric bike, in their dream garage. I'm not sure it's one of my dreams, but you've got to respect the engineering. And certainly different, lots of innovation going on in there. And that's how a market de develops. Okay, they've included in their selection the 2015 Kawasaki Ninja H2R. From memory, I think it was 300 brake horsepower. I remember when it came out, they and I was here at the show, and they were running it up until the exhausts were glowing. It sounded fabulous. Quite how usable a bike like that is. It, obviously, it's track only. It doesn't comply with um, legislation to allow it to be on the road. But just a good example of what they can do when they put their minds to it. Well, I enjoyed their selection for the Dream Garage. I think, uh, personally, I would have maybe had a Honda SP1, SP2 in it, but that's just a personal choice. It's good fun, and uh, as I say, which of us haven't done, played the game of bunny object, which bike would you have in your garage? Some of you know that I've actually got one of the yellow balls there, as they're called, and the bike that actually really switched me on to Z900s back in the day was biked in this colour. I think they call that candy green, which is the yellow and the green, which is more like the 73 colour when it first came out. I think that looks stunning. I like the SE equipment on this one with the Olins and the Brembo's at the front brake. It's got Olins at the rear and slightly modified suspension at the front. You can also have some riding experiences here. Obviously fairly limited because they are for space. It's nice to see the, um, the youngsters having a go on, a, on electric motocross bikes and uh, enjoying their day out, which is fantastic to see. People shouldn't underestimate the importance of electric off-road bikes. A lot of motocross circuits are under a lot of pressure through the noise that um, is generated through traditional internal combustion engines. Um, I, it's easy to get frustrated and, and, and point out that they've managed to buy a house next to a motocross circuit and now they're complaining about the noise. But the reality is all circuits in the UK, road or off-road, are under pressure about noise pollution and electric bikes in competition may well be the future. I've never been, been particularly interested in the Norton brand, but it is nice to see them on a, a resurgence again. And this bike, the V4CR, is absolutely stunning. So it's great to see them back in the marketplace building attractive and interesting bikes. Um, it's nice to find a KTM I can actually get on. Uh, they're normally quite tall, but this 790 is well regarded bike. And uh, as you can see, even the vertically challenged can get on it. We obviously had a chance to have a look around the Ducati stand, a brand that really is at the top of their game in terms of road racing. You know, their, their dominance in MotoGP, this bike, the British Superbike Championship, which was a fantastic championship this year. And of course, World Superbikes with Bautista. They, uh, they're really leading the way at the moment. Right, this is the um, the new M1000 XR, um, recently launched, and I'm, I personally I'm really delighted that they're they're actually making outrageously powerful bikes which you can buy for the road. Oh, that's possibly not as politically correct as some would would like, but it's it's magical to see bikes like these um, with this level of performance accessible to ordinary riders who've got enough budget to buy one of course. The bike produces 201 um, horsepower at 12,750. Some of you may recall, if you, or if you've watched the channel for a while, I actually treated myself to the M1000R, the sort of naked version of, of, of this particular sort of style and configuration. And I made a video on it. The bike is hilarious. Far more funny than you can ever show on a YouTube video, um, but just, just magical to see it.
In terms of um, torque, it's obviously a straight four engine. It hasn't got the torque of the GS that we've just talked about, but it has got very significant torque. 113 newton meters of torque at 11,100. Um, if it's anything like my 1000R version, uh, the only thing it won't pass is a petrol pump. Uh, beautifully finished. I, I love them in, in this particular color. I'm guessing that's some sort of competition package in so much as it's got carbon wheels and it's got the blue color. They, I bought the non-competition package for my um, 1000R and that's in, a, in the more traditional BMW motorsport colors, the white, the purple um, and the blue. So great looking bikes though. I've just finished a review actually on last year's XR which will be coming out I think next week if you watch them in sequence if you watch them out of sequence um, just have a look through the index and you'll find it and I thought it was a really capable bike really enjoyed it I've noticed actually with these bikes this is quite a tall bike this is 850 millimeters tall and not surprisingly a lot of the riders I see getting off the bike are a few inches taller than I am and I, I can see why having having ridden one you can obviously get lowering options but the bike as standard really suits the taller longer legged rider I think it's really ironic that um, at a time when the government wants me to go slower and slower um, manufacturers are making bikes that go faster and faster I have found that going to these shows, I often can come to a better conclusion if I give myself time to reflect on it afterwards. And indeed, that's what I've done this time. So in some of the shots, you'll, you'll see that the stands were virtually empty. And, and that's not because there wasn't anybody there. That's because the organisers were kind enough to let us on uh, onto the stands a little earlier to help us with our filming. Overall, I would describe the attendance as busy but not frenetic. Um, some of the bikes you had to queue for once the crowds came in, um, but others you could get on far more comfortably. It's, these sort of shows have changed over the years, and I know that in the past, historically, it's been the place where you go and buy the end-of-year bargains from retailers with you know, various bits of equipment, clothing, helmets, etc. Um, but there were some there this year, but it's certainly less than it has been in the past. These stands are pretty expensive spaces. And of course, we now live in a very different world. Retailers wanting to sell this year's stock off, making space for next year's new models, um, have the opportunity to do that via the internet, events like Black Friday. So it's perhaps, for those people that historically have liked the show's bargain hunting, it's perhaps not the same sort of trip that it used to be. But I think it's improved in lots of other ways. And there's certainly more riding experiences and demonstrations available. And some of which, obviously, people are showing you the capabilities of the bike and others which you can have a go yourself at, um, providing you remember to bring your license, of course. But it's good to see that and a, a real practical feel to the, to the whole show. I personally enjoy the panel chats. I think they add a bit of value and that you get you get an opportunity to get close and personal with some of the stars from the motorcycling world. I'm particularly interested in the racing side and I was interested to hear that there, there is a new sports bike class in BSB next year when we'll be seeing the likes of the new Honda 600 compete against the Yamahas, the Triumphs and I guess a few others will join that party. I always think that mid-size production based racing is exciting and I'm looking forward to seeing that addition to next year's program. There's also in the show there's um, been over the years has been gradually increasing the number of people offering tour packages for uh, motorcyclists wanting to go other parts of the world and get assistance and help and route and various things planned out for them and do it and they were out there in force and I took the opportunity to have actually have a chat to the guys that were offering the American tours and uh, which of us hasn't had that on their bucket list since God was a boy and I think one day I, I will be getting round to that it wasn't quite as frightening expense wise as I thought although I suspect by the time I've added my flights and extra baggage capacity it will soon start ticking up on the meter but definitely one that I wanted to consider and nice to have the opportunity to see what was on offer and talk to the people involved 
It is, of course, ultimately a bike show, and it is a fantastic opportunity to see all the new models. Um, of course, some of us are very well served by uh, their local dealer network, and I, I can get round to a lot of the dealer network in my local area, but some brands are better represented than others. And to have the opportunity to see the manufacturer with all the models on the stands is exciting, and I do really enjoy it. There were a couple of noticeable absences. Certainly, I think Harley Davidson not being there was perhaps the most remarkable of the absences, but I'm sure they've got their own reasons. I tried to find a motor busy stand, but I couldn't actually see one. Um, but there may have been one there, but there was a, actually a model I wanted to look at. I think the two bikes that have caught my real attention were obviously the new BMW 1300 GS is a really important bike for both BMW and indeed probably the adventure bike market so it was nice to spend a bit of time looking at that with the various options and and equipment levels available I was particularly excited I guess to see the new Suzuki um, 1000 GX because I'm such a big fan of the GT model I did, you know, I did read very briefly on it. I try not to read too much coverage before I, I ride something. Um, but I, it was described by one of, I think it was MCN, as a sort of a GT on stilts. And the dimensions certainly suggested that it would be rather tall, but actually sitting on it, in reality, it isn't. So I've got a sneaking feeling that might be under serious consideration for the, for the garage at some point next year. Anyway, I do hope that you've enjoyed this video and that you've found it useful and interesting i say i i really enjoyed the show a few of you were kind enough to come up and say hello which i really appreciated but if you have enjoyed it perhaps you'd be kind enough to press either like or consider subscribing but as is always the case what's most important is you ride safe and you stay well